when you do, it immediately begins with uh, seven admonitions uh, when you consider verses 1 through 9. Um, and, and in these seven admonitions, I call them seven divine admonitions, and, and I say that uh, thinking that in the book of Hebrews, for the most part, the book has been doctrine, uh, with, uh, along with the doctrine, a series of warnings to the Hebrew people. And, uh, and one of the things that hopefully you realize as we've gone through the book of Hebrews is that, that the book, all the way through, there's a consistency of a link between the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and the promise of the new covenant to the nation of Israel, which is yet future. And, uh, and, and the book of Hebrews acts as a link that takes uh, what we would call time past and link it to ages to come, uh, because it stands as the means of which what Christ accomplished on the cross is how he's going to, in the future, fulfill his promises to Israel, which involves the new covenant and all their blessings and their kingdom and their land and and Christ coming back to them to bless them. So the book of Hebrews has been linking that, and, uh, and as, as a result of linking time past with the ages to come, it has been doing that without regards to the age of grace. And what I mean by that is it doesn't take the age of grace to link time past with the ages to come, uh, because time past was God's program to Israel, and the things that is, that the, 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 the book of Hebrews is about is preparing them for what's about to come to them, and that's still Israel's program. And had there been no age of grace, the book of Hebrews would have linked the program of Israel straight until the coming of Christ, and, and so there doesn't need to be an age of grace, an interruption in the program. And so it, it's almost as if there's no regard that God has turned from Israel and turned to the Gentiles. It's just taking Israel and telling them that your old covenant is passing away and the new one's coming in. And, uh, and so it, it bridges the gap for the nation of Israel uh, concerning their program. And, uh, but since it's been a book about doctrine and, uh, and, and, and basically uh, giving doctrinal teaching and warning to the nation of Israel, it's this last chapter that finally the writer begins to admonish them based on the doctrine. And uh, hopefully you realize that when you take in truth and you learn some things, that it is not. It is not just for your head knowledge. Uh, God's word is supposed to work in your mind, and if it's just head knowledge that you can spew out some facts, it hasn't done its job. It does need to be maintained in the mind, but also in the heart, that the things that you learn about what God is doing does transform your life and produce action, or as the Bible calls it, fruit. Uh, just kind of on the side, just considering that verse, Look with me to 2 Corinthians before we start Hebrews here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm thinking of that song when I said the verse. That song that we didn't know whether to change the chorus where it keeps talking about what Christ did. Well, if you notice that last, the last verse said that he gave salvation free to you. And then he asked, what have you given to me? Well, that's exactly what uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 says when we consider what giving is in the great age of grace is we're supposed to remember that uh, that it was Christ who, how does it say that, Roman, in yeah, 1 Corinthians 8, uh, um, uh, he who was rich for our sakes became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. The context there is you and I figuring out how much to give in the ministry for the service, uh, for the work of the ministry. And it just throws that verse in there to remind us that he gave up heaven for us. And so... The motivation for giving is to know what God, uh, Christ has done for us. And I have, you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, because that's what Paul's expressing here concerning other service other than giving. He says in verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. The more Paul learns about the, the expanse of Christ's love in dying for everyone, because everyone was cut off from God, dead in sins. Even Israel got cut off from God, dead in sins. But in that, in that time that we're all dead in sins, Christ came and died for all. And that constrained the Apostle Paul, and, and he makes the point in verse 15, it should constrain, constrain us as well, that he died for all. There's the fact. 
that they which uh, which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So that doctrine ought to have an effect on the heart and constrain the heart and even change the course of life. That the more that you understand what Christ did, the more that ought to become the motivation for us to live for him. Well, in the Hebrew case, in Hebrews chapter uh, 13, uh, let's first read through the first nine verses and see if we can't uh, just detect the seven admonition in these verses. So we'll read them through and then I'll ask you to repeat them back to me in just seven statements. Uh, it says in verse chapter 13, verse 1, Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained strangers, uh, angels, excuse me, unawares. Remember them that are in bonds as in bond with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourself also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and uh, be content with such things as ye have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them that have the rule over you, who have spoken, uh, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. Consider the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Be not carried uh, about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace and uh, not with meats, which have not, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. So uh, then, then he begins to again go back to talking about the altar that we approach and so forth. So in those nine verses, there was seven admonitions. Can you pick them out? What's the first one? Okay, that one you got, Dave. Now you're off the hook. What's the second? Well, you got to be a little bit more than that. Okay, we, okay. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. That that'll that'll set it. Okay. What's the third admonition? Okay. Remember those that are in bonds, and then it also adds after that. Uh, which suffer adversity, so bonds and adversity, to remember them. The fourth admonition, this one is the, probably the, the less clear. Okay, the, the, to honor the marriage, uh, the sanctity of marriage. And uh, outside of marriage, uh, there's adultery and fornicators, and God will judge. So the sanctity of marriage is the to, almost like saying remember that. Uh, the fifth. Gee, this is easy. We're following verses, aren't we? <laughs> It'll get a little difficult. <laughs> so what's the fifth? Okay. The, the, the warning there about covetousness and being content with what you have. Uh, so now what's number six? Can't hear you. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay. Right, that's good enough. That's, we'll, we'll deal with the admonition and all the meaning of it, because there's detail that's given, but the six would be to remember those that have the rule over them, and then that would take you down to the seventh. Okay, the warning about diverse and strange doctrines, not to be carried about with them. So the writer gets down to those seven admonitions, and, and they're really admonitions based on all, all the things that have already been taught in the book of Hebrews. Uh, so let's go back now to the beginning, and let's look at them in some detail, especially most people are interested in verse 2, but we'll wait till we get there. In Hebrews 13, verse 1, it says, let brotherly love continue. Now, that, that might be a little, uh, just a short little statement, and one that you could go past if, if there wasn't something different in this one. When I say different, uh, you don't need to turn there, but in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 9, the Apostle Paul says, uh, Ye need not that anyone teach you uh, to love your brother, for God has taught you to love one another. Uh, so it's our talk. Concerning brotherly love, you need not that I teach you these things, for God has taught you to love one another. So there is just within, when you come to know the Lord, 
there is a natural knowledge that when you know the Lord and know who you are in the Lord, you know that there is a, uh, well, not just know that you need to love your brother, there is a natural uh, love that's taught to you from God to love your brother. Uh, but this, this admonition is a little bit different than that. And, and it's, it's different in the sense of the word there that says continue. Notice it says, let brotherly love continue. So he's not just admonishing you to love your brother. The warning is, is let that love continue. And in light of what we know from the book of Hebrews, and, and especially when I studied the book of Revelation and, and began to read about, you know, the, the different warnings to the churches in Revelation, I began to understand more and more why the gospel of 1 John, or the, the, the epistle of 1 John, is so much about love. And as you understand that the Hebrew people are going to face a real trial of faith, that they are going to need the, the fellowship of the saints and the love of the saints together to go through that time. And, and that's why the point here is not just to love your brother, but let it continue. What would happen, the opposite of letting it continue, would be to allow it to wax cold. Come to uh, Matthew chapter 24. The verse has that word, let us, and so... There, there are some things that a, that a believer can do to make sure that the love that they know that they're supposed to have uh, doesn't cool off, uh, doesn't get cold. Uh, and you get an idea from this verse uh, what would make it cold uh, in Matthew chapter 24. And I'm just I'm not going I'm going to just pull it right out of not out of context, but just take the verse itself. Uh, it says in verse 12, it says, "And because iniquity shall abound." the love of many shall wax cold. And uh, this is talking about the tribulation that's going to come on the nation of Israel. And, and, uh, and but, but in that verse, you find out what causes the love to wax cold. Not only do you know it's going to wax cold, you know what causes it to wax cold. And what causes it is the iniquity that's going to be abounding. And that if a believer would get caught up in that iniquity, that that iniquity would cause his love to wax cold. And, uh, and so when Hebrews is saying, let, let brotherly love continue, uh, then the way that is, is for them to watch out for themselves spiritually and in the coldness of the world to make sure that that doesn't rub off on them. Because there is going to be coldness in the world, and, and it describes such times as family members betraying one another. And, uh, and so it's going to be a very cold time, and, the, and the, the, the love is waxed cold because of the iniquity that's going to be abounding at the time. Now, now watch how Peter says it. Come over to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. It, it says in 1 Peter 1, verse 22, it says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. You see some, uh, you see a little bit extra emphasis on, on the love and, and the, uh, the maintaining of that love as Peter is saying it to continue in it. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's talking about there that they, they've been, uh, uh, they've been purified, uh, through obeying the truth and, and, uh, it's unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Now that now then it says, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. So that there is special attention to the relationship that they have with each other and uh, in the fact that they are going to be loving one another. It, it says in Second Peter uh, chapter 1, well, you're just not far, just Second Peter chapter 1. It goes through a list. It says, uh, like for instance in verse 2, first, Second Peter 1, 2, it says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Christ and, and Jesus our Lord, according to his divine power which he hath given un which his divine power which hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue, whereby we are we are given uh, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption uh, that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. 
uh, charity is more than just kindness. Uh, it has to do with the giving of yourself. It has to do with the love of Christ working in you to love like Christ. And, and that is that agape love that, that is an action more than just a feeling. And it's not just kindness doing something good for someone. It's giving yourself for someone. And, uh, and, and so Peter is challenging them to, to add these things to their faith and to have that relationship one to another. And you can understand it in light of what they're going to go through. And let me just read you. Well, you can flip over First John chapter 1 and uh, or chapter 3 is what I want. And First uh, John just speaks about the importance of loving one another. And it just keeps talking about if you know God, that, then, you, then you'll love your brother. And, and that if you don't love your brother, you can't love God because your brother you can see. But in, in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 11, it kind of sums it up this way by saying, For this is the message that ye have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. There is a call, uh, as, uh, as it is in the, in the uh, tribulation epistles, uh, for them to be exercising that love one to another and to be careful to maintain that love. And, and not just love, but love fervently. Not just love, but continue in that love uh, because they're going to need each other in that time. It's already been expressed to us in Hebrews, so if you're going back there, Go back just a couple chapters to Hebrews chapter 10. And it kind of explains the need for continuing in that love. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24 says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so they need to, to provoke one another to, good, to, to love and to good works, and to be assembling themselves together, and even more as they see that day approach. And the day approaching the Hebrews, as we've been studying this book, is the tribulation, the chastening that they're going to go through, the trial of the faith, as, as Peter and, and, uh, and uh, James speak about it. And as that day is approaching, more and more they're going to need each other. And so they don't, at that time, want to forsake the assembling of themselves together. They need fervent love. They need to be continuing in that love. And as the world wax colder, they need to be stronger in their love one to another. And, and it's for all of their good. Uh, go back to Hebrews. Uh, well, you're in Hebrews. Chapter 13, where we're reading. So that one little phrase... There, it's, it, there's something special there that, that they're being called to in light of everything that's been taught in the book of Hebrews. Let brotherly love continue. Then in verse 2 it says, Be not, careful, uh, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. Uh, I kind of lean toward what one of the commentaries said, is that the strangers here is not so much any stranger that comes by. But it has to do with the association in verse 1 of your love for the brethren. And, uh, and that, that your need for, for uh, loving one another is also to entertain one another in the sense that uh, you're going to need to share hospitality uh, with each other. And, uh, you know, that what, what went on in Bible days, and apparently what's going to be very needful in future days, is really something that's really... Uh, beyond our culture, and maybe it shouldn't, not maybe, it, it really shouldn't be. We need to almost overcome some of the things that our culture has done in the sense that uh, we live in closed houses, uh, call before you come and, uh, and ask if you, uh, if you want to come and visit me and if you want to stay overnight, I'll get you a motel. Uh, that, it, it, that's almost the culture that we live in. Uh, when you think about Bible days when uh, Abraham sent his servant to go find Isaac, uh, a wife, that he comes and she says, she says, come to my house, there's a place for you, we'll take care of your camels and all. And she wasn't afraid when she got home, they're going to say, why did you invite that guy to our house? No, they, they, they took him in, they fed him, they fed his camels, and, and then they got talking about the business that he was there for. Uh, they were open for those things. And, and constantly you see in the Bible where, where people were, would just come and someone totally, that the family didn't know. Uh, stayed with them, and uh, sometimes stayed out in the barn, but stayed with them. Uh, 
and 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 so they did entertain strangers in this sense. I, I could you imagine someone come into town, knock on your door, and says, uh, "I'm a fellow believer. I don't know where to go. I heard that you're a believer. Do you have a place for me tonight?" <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that would really be tough, wouldn't it? And uh, and and yet, there's some way that we need to both protect our families because that's a responsibility we have. But at the same time, we're so culture oriented that. Uh, uh, that sometimes I think that we're not hospitable in the sense, in the biblical sense of the word. Uh, I don't know that me preaching to you that I'm any different than you would handle the situation. I just get convicted by the Bible sometimes that we're just way off base in how we do this. In this day, if you can consider what we've been learning in the book of Hebrews about, about, uh, what they're going to face. And if they're going to face a time where people are going to be per- persecuting them for their faith, uh, and, and if you're going to go through a time where you can't buy or sell without the mark of the beast, will they be able to go to a motel? If they're a stranger, if they're wandering, they had to flee their hometown, and they don't know where to go, and they go to another place, can they just go to a motel? Uh, no, they, they can't even sleep in the park. They're going to get arrested and then identified. They're going to need for people to be willing to entertain strangers unaware. Uh, uh, Angels unaware is what the verse says, but, but entertain strangers. The unaware part is that they're, that strangers themselves, they're, they're not, they don't really know them. Uh, they might know of them. They might have a, a witness of their testimony, in fact, but, but the willingness to be hospitable. Uh, consider what the, the tribulation epistles say about that. Come to James chapter two. It's a passage that you're probably very familiar with, but now in the context, has a lot more meaning than when some people try to throw it in grace. James chapter 2, and I start with verse 12, so you realize why the illustration he's going to use. He says, and it's a command in in chapter 2 of James, verse 12, "So, So speak ye, and so do ye, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy." And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Now they're going to be judged, aren't they? And they're going to be judged according to what he calls the law of liberty, but he explains in verse 7, if they show mercy, what are they going to receive from God? They're going to receive mercy. But if they show no mercy, what are they going to receive from God? No mercy. This is just like Israel under the law, where if you show, if you forgive, you'll be forgiven. If you won't forgive, you won't get forgiven. So then he says in verse 14, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, but have not works? Can faith save him? Now, I always go back to the previous verse. Save him from the way God's going to judge him. And in the illustration, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of food, and one of them, one say unto the, uh, and one say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things that are needful for the body. What doth it profit? Even so, uh, uh, even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. And if they're going to be judged by showing mercy and receiving mercy, and if they don't show any mercy, they won't get any mercy, what do you think the judgment's going to be when a brother says, Oh, I'm a believer, and you're a believer too? Well, be ye warmed and filled, and you send him away, and he's hungry and naked like he came to you. You think that you, your faith is enough there? Apparently not. That's the whole context of the uh, of the of the teaching here. Is is their relationship that covenant relationship that that they're going to be judged under? That they they need to show mercy to receive mercy, and then it profits them to show that mercy. And uh, but there's an illustration of someone coming who's hungry and uh, is it, yeah naked. If a verse 15, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of food, and you just send them away. Now, the, the, the context of Hebrews is warning them uh, the, that they should entertain to remember, uh, to uh, entertain, or not remember, but be not forgetful to entertain strangers. Uh, they need to be hospitable. In fact, look, look at chapter 1, verse 17. Oh, is that the one I want? Oh, no. The, yeah, the reference in 27, 127. It says, but pure, it says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. 
you know, you think about what's going to come to the nation of Israel, what they're going to go through, and if there is going to be persecution, uh, and if a man isn't good, if he, if he it refuses to take the mark, he can not only not provide for his family, he might be taken away and killed. And if a man is killed for his testimony in Christ, wouldn't they hope that the brethren are going to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and take care of their needs? Well, that, that's what James is writing. That's, that's pure religion and undefiled. There is, there is that relationship that's extending past the family because they're going to, they're challenged and, and taught to love the brethren in light of, of what they're going to go through. And the more that that is, is, is what they're going to go through, the more they need to practice this. Uh, come to 3 John. This is a, a book that maybe is not read too often, but it's all about that subject. It shows almost the way that some of this is played out. Third John, just before the Jude and Revelation. It says in, in verse 5, it says, Beloved, thou dost faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, Thou shalt do well, because that for the name, uh, for his name's sake, they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such, that we may be fellow uh, helpers of the truth. So the Gentiles there would be the unsaved, and that that these people did well in that that they receive someone and and help him out and send him out in a godly sort. That what they are do, they're helpers of the faith by receive, receiving him, taking care of his needs, and sending him on. Now, the reason that's written there is there is a religious man in this city that John is writing to, and John is writing to a man called Gaius up in verse 1, who apparently, when you kind of put all of it together, Gaius was probably thrown out of the church for helping another believer. Because John himself wants to come there, but look what verse 9 says. I wrote unto the church, but the atrophies, who loveth the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. He said, I'd like to come see you. And he said, forget it. Not here. Not you, John. I'm the pastor of this church. They won't receive John, the apostle. And it says in verse 10, Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, uh, prating uh, against us with malicious words and not uh, content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the, the brethren, and forbidding them that would, and casting them out of the church. He won't receive the brethren, and if you receive the brethren, you're out of the church. Well, I think that's why John's writing to Gaius and saying, you did well, you did right. But see, there, there it's going on, where someone is coming through, and he takes them in and sends them out, for the truth's sake, and it is helping a brother and sending him out, but you also have the, the seed planted there of the religious control that, that goes against the word of God and uses exorcism and fear on people that would do what God wants. And, and John writes to encourage them people, you keep doing what's right. And, and don't forget to entertain strangers, no matter what Diotrephes has to say. And, uh, and, and, and so you see it played out there. Come back to... Uh, well, Hebrews chapter 13, when it says in that verse, uh, what does it say, for thereby, remember, uh, no, my verse 2 is indented, and it looks like verse 3 is verse 2 in my Bible. Verse 2 says, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby, that is, the entertaining of a stranger, thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Now, there is... Some commentaries totally skip that. Other commentaries want to talk about angels, the word angelos being ministers, and, uh, and, and change it to human ministers, which in the case of 3 John, that's definitely was the case, is, uh, that the people that came through that area were, were probably just ministers of the truth of God's word. Uh, but the illustration here gives a, a statement that some people have entertained strangers unaware, or angels unaware, uh, by being remindful rather than being forgetful, they, they knew to practice hospitality, and in the, in the result of doing that, some have entertained angels. 
Now we're going to look at, at, at a few cases that I think that it might be referring to about the entertaining of angels. But when we do, don't get all caught up in the angels and, and, and think about that. The point of that statement is when it says, thereby, uh, uh, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares, the point is, is that those who were, would remember to show hospitality and, and take in a stranger and, and, uh, and send him on his way after he's, after he's shown some hospitality, that if, if they have done that to an angel, the ones who have, have actually received the blessing. The point is, is those who were who remembered to do that, they not only helped someone out, but they themselves had been blessed by doing that. And that's why the statement is that some have entertained angels unawares. Uh, it, it really causes, that verse causes a lot of people and a lot of stories to come up. You know, and, and they don't use it the way the Bible uses it. Most of the stories, you know, I was, I was getting ready to turn left and I thought I saw someone standing there, so I went straight and boy, if I would have turned left, a train just went by, the signal wasn't working, and that must have been an angel that stood by there and, and protected me. And, uh, or I took someone in, you know, you get all these stories, took someone in, drove down the road, and they were a hitchhiker and told me these things. I dropped them off, and then someone told me, no, there was no hitchhiker on the road. You know, you get just all these stories where people say, boy, I must have entertained an angel unaware. And, uh, and, and all the time that they do that, it's always that the angel, you know, that something happened in, 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 as a result of doing that, and they're all caught up in the fact that it was an angel. Well, it, there was those who entertained angels unaware in the Bible. And uh, and I'm not sure that some of these are unaware. My first r recalling of such an incident is Genesis chapter 18. Genesis 18. Now, now watch how this happens. It's It says in Genesis 18 verse 1, it says, The Lord, the Lord appeared unto him uh, uh, in the plains of Mamre as he sat in the tent door in the in the heat of the day and that is the Lord's going to appear to Abraham now here's how it happened verse 2 and he lifted up his eyes and looked and lo three men stood by him uh, and when he saw them he ran to meet them uh, from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said my Lord if 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 now I have found favor in thy sight pass not away I pray thee from from my thy servant let a little water, I pray thee, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under a tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort you, uh, comfort ye, uh, your hearts, after that ye have passed, uh, after that ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come, uh, to your servant. And they said, So do, as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened, uh, into his, into the tent unto Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine Kneel, knead it, and make cakes uh, upon the heath. And uh, Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a, a, a calf tender and, and good and gave it unto the young man, and he hastened to, to dress it. And he took butter and milk and, and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return un unto thee according to the time of life. So let Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now, that that is going on. And uh, the whole thing is, so far, there's there is some indication to me that Abraham knows who these people are. But nothing has been said. For instance, when you look down in verse 3, when he says, My Lord, if, if, I, if I now have found favor in thy sight, uh, pass not away. He's calling him Lord, but it's not this Lord. When you look down in verse uh, 13, he, he said Sarah was going to have a wife. And then in verse 13 it says, And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Well, you realize who one of these men are, don't you? That's capital L, capital O, capital R, the capital D. That's Jehovah God. That the three men that showed up to talk to Abraham, all, he begins to make this promise that Sarah, that I am going to come and Sarah is going to have a child. And then the Bible tells us that it was the Lord who's talking and, and making this promise. When you get down to verse 22, it says, 
Uh, and the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. So there was three that went up, right? And, uh, and two of the men left, and the one stayed with Abraham, and the one who stayed was the Lord. And he begins to tell Abraham about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, the two of them, look at chapter 19, it says, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in, the, sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and bowed himself, uh, himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my Lord, turn in, I pray you, into my, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and, uh, and ye shall rise up early and go on, go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And uh, no way was Lot going to let them stay in the street all night because all the homosexuals chased them even in the house. And uh, and so I don't know, just like Abraham, I, it seems like Abraham knew these were special visits. Uh, it seems like Lot knows that these are some kind of special people. But the, it's interesting in verse 22 of chapter 18, they're called two men who leave. When they show up at Sodom, those two men are angels. And, uh, and both Abraham and Lot entertained those men. But you know, in entertaining those men, it, it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just, uh, uh, an angel happened to be there. Those angels were coming to both inform Abraham and Lot about what was going to happen and to deliver Lot from the destruction that was going to take place in Sodom and Gomorrah. They were, they were sent as, we would call them guardian angels. They were angels that were going to protect them. They delivered messages and they protect uh, both Abraham, or particularly, they, in both cases, they did that for Lot. Now, you know, there's other cases. Uh, come to the Judges, chapter 6. Oh, boy, the time really went by. But you know what? I don't really have time to, to go through some of these. I find them interesting. In, in Judges chapter 6, we're not going to go there. Uh, in Judges chapter 13, you've got these angels who, who keep appearing, and perhaps we'll look at them next week. Uh, but the one thing that I want you to get out of that is, why did the angels appear? And in, in the case that we just looked at, and, and when we look at these others in Judges, we'll see that the angels appeared for the purpose of, of delivering that message and, and protecting them uh, from a time of judgment that was coming. And, and let's go back to Hebrews so we can tie it up and, and uh, put something together. Anyhow, Hebrews chapter, go to Hebrews chapter 1. Because some of these things we've already talked about. Hebrews chapter 1, in verse 14, when it's talking about Christ being greater than the angels, we learn this about angels. He says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who are heirs of salvation? And, and, and the context there is what they're talking about is angels. And that angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who are heirs of salvation. Well, the question that, that has to come up, and uh, we'll just start with this in the next class, is if, if that's what angels are, they're ministering spirits, so they're, they're going to come and, and, and minister God's word, but also they're ministers to those who are heirs of salvation, the salvation of this book is that to those who look for Christ, will he return the second time without sin unto salvation. It's salvation in that kingdom. Angels had been used in the past to minister to the nation of Israel, to bring them God's word and to, and to deliver them, and especially in the time of Judges, that's what it's all about, is delivering them from, from judgment upon the, of the Gentiles upon them. Well, the question comes up then, is if God did that for Israel in the past, is he going to do that for Israel in the future? And when I read verse 14, if they're, if they're going to minister to those who are heirs of salvation, and then add that to that, the verse that we're studying in Hebrews chapter 13, in uh, verse 2, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares, is that God does indicate it does seem here, and I, I, we'll have some other verses to look at, that angels are going to be used of God to help the believing remnant of Israel and to deliver them 
in times uh, of, that they're facing that's going to come upon them in the tribulation. And, uh, and so it would be fitting just to leave Hebrews uh, 13.2 mean just what it says, that some have entertained angels unawares. And we'll talk about how God might do that in the future next week. Boy, that went by. It seemed like I talked 15 minutes. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for our class. And, and uh, Father, we do thank you that as we study these things that we are reminded that the, the truths that we learn should have fruit in our life. And uh, as the Hebrew saints are um, admonished concerning their love and their hospitality for the saints, I do pray, Lord, that we ourselves have been challenged about the need of loving one another and the need of showing hospitality and, uh, and, and using our homes as avenues to refresh the saints and, and send those on who have the truth. And uh, so, Father, I thank you for the things that we've studied and, and pray that as we study them, um, we would be blessed and benefited. In Christ's name we ask. Amen.